So welcome to Face to Face and today we're going to talk about nuclear, we're going to talk about Nagasaki. I'm with uh, Brent who is a writer, author, actor and who just uh, have a, a book, a new book coming out on uh, August 9th. Welcome to Face to Face, Brent. Thank you very much, David Anderson. Hello, New York. So, so you are, you, before we go to the book, can, can I ask you for the audience to to give the context of a little bit of what happened in Nagasaki 75 years ago. After that, follow with, uh, with your book. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as, as the world knows, in August the 9th, 1945, from Tinian Air Force Base, uh, uh, B-57 jet went over Nagasaki and uh, dropped the world's first plutonium bomb on the civilization. Now, it was quite an unusual story itself. It was almost like a, a, a movie script because it was full of errors right from the get-go. Uh, they were uh, not originally going to go to uh, Nagasaki. They had another destination in mind, Kokura, and uh, there was too much uh, interference coming from the clouds and from tires burning uh, on the ground. They put up a screen there. So they went to their secondary location, uh, which was Nagasaki. And uh, even before they launched, one of their fuel pumps went faulty. And uh, they were worried whether or not they couldn't access their uh, extra fuel. So they almost abandoned the whole mission before they took off. But uh, at the last minute, they decided to uh, give it a go. Oh, yes, that will have been a good idea to just cancel it. But anyway, so... so so, so the first bomb uh, explodes, and, and uh, you, you cover this in your book very well. Uh, your book, it's like a movie, more or less. It's, it's, a fiction, it's, it's, it's a fiction, but it's like an action movie with, you know, uh, at 10.02 and, and 11.05, and, and this is really what happened? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I wanted, I, I did a lot of studying with the transcripts. Uh, that were available at the time for the actual flight transcripts with the uh, Tibbets and all the guys that were uh, were on the uh, on the crew, but I was fascinated with the fictional idea of what are people actually thinking at that moment. These are men, and they they may be military men, and they're in the middle of a war, but they're still they are already know, and this group already knew what happened in Hiroshima three days prior. So they were going there with the full knowledge that they were going to be killing upwards of 100,000 people in one foul uh, swoop, as uh, Macduff would say in Macbeth. So that is what I tried to play with during that earlier chapters was the uh, moral consequences going on in everybody's minds. And, and how do you will uh, synthesize that, that moment for them? Because it was not like the first one where people didn't know what was exactly uh, edge bomb, but, but the second one, everybody know what was going to happen. Rise in 1945 in, in Japan at that time, how little communication was presented. Uh, it wasn't like our modern world. So uh, the people, the, the, even the emperor and everybody else, they had a, a heck of a time getting their minds around this zeitgeist of such an explosion. They had never seen anything like this before in the event horizon moment of our 20th century. So I don't think that people of Nagasaki uh, had any idea because they were just going around living their moment to moment lives when that bomb dropped. So obviously they weren't all in shelters. They hadn't been warned. There was no communication. And how did you come up with the book? How, how the book uh, came about and, and why why a novel? Why a fiction? Why um, um, it's for you? It's as an actor and as a screenwriter. I mean, it's very clear that the book it's it's like a movie already. So that was your intent to to David, go. David, are you psychic? Well, I never told you this, and I never sent you this in our our pre press stuff. But Shadows of Nagasaki yeah. was originally a screenplay I wrote. So I've done things a bit backwards here. Ah, <laughs> no, no, but you can, you, I mean, you, you can see when you go through the pages, then it's really, it, it's already a movie. It, it, I mean, you're missing very few 
uh, besides the dialogue who has to be developed and, and, and the main characters, but the, the, the script it's already there. I mean, I can, I will, I will can see the scenario. I can see where you put the cameras. I can. The reviewers that are starting to come in and trickle are saying it's an extremely visual novel, yeah. and that I think it's because I think visually as a storyteller, and and the screenplay itself was ex very expensive and very difficult to get made. So I thought, well, if I write this as a novel and flesh it out, because it's, it, it's a chilling good story, then if we can become a bestseller as a novel, then we'll come back again and revisit, revisit it as a, uh, a screenplay. Because, you know, you're really uh, getting screenplays made is a, a very difficult task. Uh, getting a novel published isn't. But I will say one more thing, if I could. Um, it's also had an intermediary history be before it became the novel. After I wrote the screenplay and did what I could to market it, I befriended a very wonderful, dynamic lady who I think actually you should have on your show. She, her name is Sashi Rummel. She's extremely articulate. She's 88 years old, and she is one of the living survivors of Hiroshima. And uh, she's still talking to this day. And we spoke at length, and she described to me a lot and told me, uh, gave me tremendous insights uh, to that moment, to that event horizon moment. So how did you, uh, how did you come up with the ideas of the shadow and the, and the, 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 the revenge and, and the all, uh, uh, in some way, the, the drama of the drama of, of what happened? Part of it's got to do with my spirituality and my meditation. I'm a meditation teacher. I'm very interested in expanded consciousness, metaphysics. And so I wasn't so concerned. I'm not a political creature. Uh, I'm a, more of a spiritual creature. And I was ex I'm interested in exploring the ramifications of playing with the atomic molecule itself, the, what the consequences, what the karmic consequences are of actually playing with the atom. And, if, and, and I'm not the first person to come up with that because the original Godzillas and all the Japanese movies of that time, the Zeitgeist, the geist of that time was got to do with playing with nuclear energy in such a way that it creates karma that comes back at you, you know? So in, in a way, I owe a lot to Godzilla for this, uh, for this uh, novel. But I think it's also very important that I've, I've tried to take a very empathetic view from both sides. I don't blame the Japanese. I don't blame the Americans. I just say, you play with the atom. And this is the kind of karma that can come back at you. And uh, what was very interesting was uh, I first discovered the shadows of Nagasaki just online, looking at these amazing shadows. Because out of the 60 or 80,000 people that were immediately killed, uh, David, there was only six or eight in each of these cities shadow victims. Because if you can imagine, to get a, to get a shadow victim, you had to have the bomb here. You had to have the victim here. You had to have a, a, either a concrete or a steel girder or something there, and you had to have that flash because it became a photograph. And so it was just, there was nothing left of these beings. And some of them were bicycles and, oh my God, it was just so grotesque. But it was also, hmm, where are their souls? What happens to the soul? And that is when the Yuri mythology came in. I didn't even know about the Yuri. And then I discovered that in Japanese mythology, those that are killed extremely violent, quickly, and don't know who their assassins are, cannot know rest, eternal rest, until they remain as ghosts and as ghosts destroy their uh, killers. So you are telling me then you need some kind of, of reconciliation process to until uh, uh, to, to, to eliminate the ghost in some ways. Creatively, dramatically, the best arc that I could come up with was we are introduced to our, to our five victims early on as living beings. And so that's interspersed with the bomb dropping. So we get to know who they are, yeah. what their background is. Yeah. And then as Yuri ghosts, they are devoid of emotion, of being able to come into contact with their emotions because they have to become efficient killing machines. But these are very special kinds of ghosts, the Yuri. And so they, the more they start killing the descendants 
of the atomic uh, project in Los Alamos, the more they start to have emotional uh, feelings again. So they become conflicted within their own selves, but they're still under the spell of the goddess uh, of the dark world, of that dark world, which is Izanami. And so there's that that goes on. And of course, we all know that love is the most important thing. So that's one of the themes that I deal with. What The main character is a Japanese girl in her mid uh, 20s whose great great grandfather is one of the shadows and there there becomes an interaction there do you have anything that i then you want to mention specifically about the books and um before we we wrap up a little bit we're going to come back to the nuclear story but um anything about the book then people should know about Oh, I'm not too much of a marketer, but uh, I thought just once in a while, for example, when I did Poe, my feature film was the f world's first feature on Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. It just happened to be the timing that it was his 200th anniversary of his birthday. Wow. And, and so that's when I launched the, the film, the feature film all around the world. And, and it did very well from that because when you're an unknown, and you're not connected to the studios and you're an independent artist, you want to have that. So what a better time for me to be able to launch my novel at August the 9th at 11.01 a.m. on Amazon and Lulu and everywhere, uh, which is the exact time that they, they dropped the, the bomb on Nagasaki. So I'm just tying that in, but also very much as a homage. Uh, I really, this, this book is, is really so important for us to remember that nobody wins in the nuclear conflict and, and there's so much going on in the world with despots on the button right now. I'm very concerned. No, and, and, and that's what I, I like, and that's why I was very interested to interview you, because I cover, uh, and, and we work, we did a, Presenza did a documentary on, 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 uh, on nuclear, and then and we work on a treaty to ban, to ban the uh, nuclear weapons treaty. We got 40 countries, and we're missing 10, and then it's going to be able to be passed at the UN where um, the production, the consumption, the sale of any nuclear weapon will be banned. Uh, I mean, I know it looked like very uh, uh, futuristic, but it could be done. Uh, so I was like, wow, well, somebody is writing a, an interesting book on a novel with really an action type of, uh, of writing. I was very, really, uh, and I think it's a great contribution to, uh, to, to show and then touch and, and, and go to the people with that line of, of, uh, 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 of direct uh, um, writing and creative writing. So congratulations, because I think it's a very important work that you are doing. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, anything, to, anything to say about nuclear weapons and, and, and your, uh, your study concerning the book? And uh, because it's uh, 35 years, then we are uh, doing it, we have the world to uh, with different treaty to load down the number of nuclear weapons, to load down the, the head to not develop it anymore. But it's, it's still a complicated uh, uh, political project to to propose at the world. So any uh, any uh, things you learn from on that on that oh, journey? So, to so much from talking with so many of the survivors. Do you know at this time, as I've been trying to market the book in Japan as well. And I just find the Japanese people so deep and so spiritual. And they are not um, uh, doing too much on this 75th. That they would rather just not remember this. Yeah. This isn't something that they want. They're so private. We cannot imagine what it would be like. And no matter, my novel is a horror novel in the sense in science fiction where it went, if, when you eventually read the fi final amounts, David, you'll see I don't pull back on the strings because... No matter what I describe creatively, fictitiously, yeah. we can never, ever, ever yeah. reproduce that in the reality yeah. of, of, of the mothers carrying their children in, and their guts. And, and so that, that is the horror. And I just think, wish the world would understand that, yes, World War II, and it's, there was so much talk on both sides. You know, the U.S. government, this will save half a million American lives and, 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 and lives of the Allies because the, the Japanese at that point were run by a despot and, and they wouldn't have surrendered. And so in that way, it's very true. In the other token, uh, this was a military war and the civilians are always the greatest victims. 
And so really Nagasaki wasn't a military complex. It's shipping yards and stuff, but it wasn't there. Kokoro was the original target. So it basically destroyed 60, 80,000 civilians in one foul swoop. And this horror, these, this many souls going into the, to the pot so quickly is it's just horrific. So I'm worried, David, uh, because I see guys like Donald Trump and I don't mind naming it. I'm, I'm not a political creature, but I'm, and you got the leader of North Korea, and you got so many people with with nuclear capabilities that are not balanced, normal human beings. They're egomaniacs and kleptomaniacs and whatever it is that despots need to. Who knows if they don't have a death wish, you know? And and you go a little bit beyond that scenario where accident could happen. We cannot still play with fire and not believing then we're not going to be burned at some point. We, The kids know that very well. I think with the COVID-19, we have an experience and if we are not on the watch for anything who, has, uh, who, who, who could be uh, um, like a pandemic, uh, we see then, then things could happen. So nuclear weapons are much more complicated and dangerous uh, and, and, and very complicated to, to deal with than the COVID-19 because uh, they kill everybody, and and there's no nurse, there's no doctor. I mean, you have a story of the, this woman who was looking at the poem of water. I think it was very touching, uh, of this poor girl who was looking for water, and and I drink oil more or less. I don't. That's that's in the Nagasaki. That is an actual statue in the Nagasaki Museum. Abso absolutely, and I think one of the other things we we never a uh, real important thing is is that. You know, when these weapons first came out, David, there was a whole, another book called The Atomic Soldiers. The Americans themselves sent tens of thousands of their soldiers, and most of them were Hispanic, black, and poor boys from the South. And they sent them right after those tests were over. Let's go clean up. Let's take pictures. Wow. And there's tens of thousands of those guys mutated organs and their families. This is life. We, we don't need it. We have solar energy. We have new sources of energy coming up all the time. Yeah. Why do we need nuclear? Why do we have to play with the God molecule? And, that, and that's exactly the problem of uh, nonviolence. Non if you don't invest, if you are not creative on building nonviolence, you end up using violence. And you, violence is a short term and no solution and, and doesn't do the process that you really want to develop. So it's, it's, it's really a disaster. <laughs> And, you know, these bombs right now, from the, my research, uh, you know, these bombs aren't like the ones that were dropped in Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima. They're hundreds of times more powerful in 2020. Yeah. And, you know, it's like anything else. If you build a, uh, build a house, people come. So if you build a bomb, eventually you have enough bombs. they got to get used. I know that's not exactly the point. Okay, the last, the, last word, the last word about your book, and then we close. I would love to see this novel reach as many people around the world as possible to entertain them, but to also open up their eyes to, to what the responsibilities that we have as human beings and that nobody wins. No side becomes the winner in, in this game. And ultimately, I'd like to see it made into a movie again, because that was my original goal. And I think we could reach billions of people like that. So that's what I'm hoping for Shadows of Nagasaki. Thank you so much for Brian for being on the show. Uh, that was your show face to face and please keep watching your news on presenza.com and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you.